Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Tripp, and I am sitting right next to the one and the only Barry Taylor. What up, homie? Oh, yeah. That's right. And uh, we're in the uh, the wonderful podcast studio at the Hatchery in we Redondo Beach. Looking out at a courtyard. The courtyard. And a gorgeous blue sky. Well, I'm in, in the uh, griddle. The griddle, where... Serious foodings happen on oh, a regular yeah. occurrence. If you you know if you were a fan of uh, it's omelets, every, it's not everywhere that has a short Irish cook. No, it's studying, not. Studying Nathan doesn't do that. Studying theology and knocking out omelets. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, can I say bacon? Bacon. Um, yeah. So today on the podcast, uh, you get to hear Barry and I talk with the one and only Walter Brueggemann. And, uh, yeah, we do. Well, actually, we're sort of listening. Yeah. We're going to listen to Walter's program because I think, you know, Walter can talk. He knows how. And he's got more to say than either one of us. Well, so we're just going to let him talk. You mean quality we? material. Quality Let's material. Not look. Yeah. yeah, I mean, verbosity <laughs> outside. Verbosity <laughs> aside, Walter's probably going to have a lot more to say about money and possessions than you or I. Mm-hmm. In a cohesive, biblically incline close to the text way what do you think uh, I, I think so yeah. I definitely think so yeah. and in, in the great thing about him being on is now we can tell people about uh, a little like uh, giveaway we're doing yeah well it's kind of not a little giveaway really it's, it's a, big a giveaway. serious giveaway a serious giveaway that uh, we're doing a giveaway of um, well, well one uh, we're gonna have a number of winners all of whom when if you win you get the the class that Walter Brueggemann taught here at the hatchery yeah he which taught is phenomenal on in the introduction to the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And, and I'm just you know, saying. And his wife to say about that. He knows some stuff. He does. <laughs> he's, got, he's got some stuff to share. Yeah. So if you, uh, if you, even the runner-up winners will get uh, the entire uh, lectures he gave introducing Hebrew scripture. Well, what, what we did not record was the evening time in which yeah. uh, Brueggemann uh, sat with all the students here at the hatchery around a circle. And, and and just uh, did like two hours of informal Q and A. Yep. And wh- how would you, how would you describe that experience? Because I know I went to the I've done a lot of theological education. Yep. You have. I never had an opportunity to hear Brueggemann rocket lecture style like a master in the morning, yep. and then in the evening, you know, just pull the cork out and Bordeaux it up with Brugge. Yeah, Bordeaux with Brueggemann. But what what was great actually about it is not only um, his really sweet demeanor and openness to everybody but the fact that after a couple of hours you weren't tired of listening to him talk Mm -hmm. and that he actually also spent a lot of time seriously listening to the questions that were asked and answering them with depth and Mm -hmm. not just some platitude so it was kind of an amazing thing pity we didn't capture that well we we captured it we were just not giving well, I know, something away, just can't be given away. Well, and in, in part of it is for uh, at the hatchery, since it's kind of an alternative type of theological education, and we get to bring in all sorts of different teachers for stuff, and we want to, uh, you know, have the, have the engagement with critical thinking, biblical studies, like with Brueggemann, but also in the evening when they got to ask questions, each of our students are working on launching their own common cause community, yeah. uh, kind of like an alternative style community, an alternative style church, a business around a cause, a nonprofit, uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, a dream. A, and an against empire. Yeah, trying to stick it to the yeah, system for that's Jesus. Right. That's right, for the man. And, um, uh, you know, Pharaoh debunkers. Um, and so each of them were able to kind of share the way in which the their cause that they're hoping to create a community around uh, in, engaged Hebrew scriptures. And then he's like giving them ideas, which is like, yeah, it's, it's it's cheating. Really, you, they're going to yeah. get to go preach sermons and be like, so one time I was talking to Walter Brueggemann about uh, food actually, insecurity. And they actually were. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually had something to say, yeah. Yeah. So, But I also think he was he, he was actually quite interested in what the students were up to mm-hmm. and found some uh, resonance himself in, in those things. But, yeah, it was great. So we're giving away the lectures from his class. Yes. What else are we doing? And, and, and the like, grand prize winner grand is going to get le grand prix, exactly. as it were. Gets, Just quote the Hebrew. Gets the class, which is uh, an amazing, amazing class. Plus, we have a giant book set of Brueggemann. Really? We can't do every book he's written because he's got like 60-some. He's got more um, books than the Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah, I think but, he's written four while we've been doing this intro. <laughs> yeah. Longhand. So, so he, 
he's got a. Um, so we'll, you'll have the books that we read for the class itself, yeah. and then the books that have come out out of all the themes that are connected in it. Yeah. So you know you'll you'll be able to get a whole stack of pages of the Brugi and uh, the, the audio experience uh, uh, of the class at Patrick. And how is how is that accomplished, Trip? Well, what you do is you go on the internet. Yeah. Well, you can go to the Hatchery Facebook page. You go to Homebrewed Christianity where the podcast is posted, and you'll have a link there. But um, it'll be a giveaway, and then it's one of those that every time you get one of your friends to enter to win, then you get three extra entries. So it encourages uh, a, a fellowshipping approach to the giveaway. Wow. Uh-huh. Because sharing is caring. Yeah, but then what if you give three away and then you don't win? How do you feel about that? Well, you or is I it don't the, win? Yeah, well, you know, I got to do this intro with you, so I'm a winner, you know? Well, uh, thanks, Trip. Everybody's a winner, really. Aren't they? Well, yeah, everybody wins. Yeah, yeah, because his love wins. Exactly. But I still win as a loser. Someone's going to walk away happy. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, so, uh, you can this is going well, this introduction, well, I think. You know, when I think of uh, efficient intros, yeah. um, I do not think of homebrew Christianity. Yeah. I I like to tell you people... Know, you know we're not getting on NPR, right? No. You know that yeah. we're just not getting there. Okay, well, here's how NPR would do this. Hello. I hope you enjoy that cool jazz tone. Um, this is uh, not a month in which I'm going to solicit your giving, uh, thanks to avoiding a, a government shutdown and the defunding of NPR, so... I'm just going to remind you that uh, you can enter a giveaway. And now, a 15-minute news piece on crabbing on the northeast coast of Newfoundland. Mm. And if you aren't um, <clears throat> going to be crabbing all summer, you can come to Theology <laughs> Beer Camp <laughs> in August in Denver, uh, the uh, 17th and 18th, um, and then the next weekend in Oklahoma City. I'm going to be doing that. Um, uh, Pete's going to be there. It's going to be fun. Go to theologybeercamp.com. I'm, I'm working on peer pressuring Barry into coming. Really? Yeah. Well, that's why I was going to put it in the intro. It's a form of peer pressuring. Because people are going to go. They might want to hear more about the hatchery. They're like, so I get, would get to hang out with you and Barry in California if I went to the hatchery? And the Absolutely. answer is yes. The answer is yes. Really, you ought to. But if you want to use your undergrad student loans to research where you should go to graduate school, then you should go to beer camp if you're 21 and talk to us about it there. Yeah. <laughs> That's how we do recruitment. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're also going to be at Wild Goose Festival um, in, in North Kakalak. And if you are a homebrewed Christianity listener, make sure you message me or Nathan so that we add you the list of all the homebrew-related people so we camp together. Because, uh, well, I, I shouldn't even put on an intro the perks of camping with homebrew-related people. Yeah. Unless you are averse to um, uh, bearded men that snore. Then... Uh, <laughs> Don't get near homebrew because once you have a few people with beards that had beer, then yeah. the snoring can be significant. Yeah. Um, the last thing is... It's another rumble in the if, jungle. <laughs> if you are a, a youth minister, a progressive youth minister, then you can join the Open and Relational Youth Ministry course. That's a video course uh, that I developed, and then it has a whole online community. So you can connect with other youth ministers, uh, share ideas, um, your curriculum, uh, vent together, and all that kind of stuff. Just text Open Youth without a space to 44222. Or you can go with There's no snoring at that one, right? No, because it's yeah. digital. Yeah, digital. I don't make a video of myself snoring. No? No. I think that should be the intro to Home Fruit. You know what, my, what the youth called me when I was youth minister? No. minister? They called me the Rolling Thunder Review. <laughs> Because I told them that was my favorite Dylan album, but, you know, the live album with the band. I, I, I know that album, yes. Yeah. Um, the, my it, my favorite song on it, though, is yeah. Up on Cripple Creek. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that song, but that version of it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Oh, yeah. So you bumping it? Not as good as uh, our conversation with Walter Brueggemann. Not as good. So, I, you know, buckle your I'm theological I'm excited about belts. it because his new book is uh, pretty spectacular. Mm-hmm. Money and possessions. Yeah, so two lightweight topics. Mm -hmm. There's only Walter Brueggemann can talk about them. And the interesting thing is he's delving into the New Testament in a significant way in this book. I know. Which is, you know, don't you think it's kind of remarkable? He spent his whole entire career digging around in, in the Old Testament with occasional forays into the New just to tie it. Now he's sort of essentially retired which means he's working even more and writing more, <laughs> and suddenly decides it might not be a bad time to now consider how to read all this stuff straight through the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Like he's gone through a door that he'd kept closed for his entire academic career. Now he's opened it, and he opens it, and you go, oh my God, why wasn't he a New Testament theologian? It, it, 
I, I just want you to know it was a, it was it was a bit uh, um, impressive and makes you think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 One day when I grow up, I will uh, accidentally pick up an entire new field and make new insights. And yeah. And, and great thing for progressive people, he figured out a way that to not hate Paul. So yeah. prepare yourself. Right. I think he likes Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coming around on the good Paul. <laughs> All right. Enjoy. Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and today on the podcast is the one and the only Walter Brueggemann. And uh, sitting right next to me in my office at the hatchery in Redondo Beach is Barry Taylor. Hello, mate. And and we're excited. So thank you so much for joining us again, Walter. I'm glad to get to talk with you. Thank you. I I was reminded on uh, on on Twitter a couple days ago that. Uh, it's it has been eight years since your first visit to Homebrew Christianity, and uh, and so you know I feel like this is a an a relationship. It's like a double, it's like a double presidency. Yeah, yeah. So two terms. Well, uh, of well, yeah. Let's hope we don't have one of those right away. <laughs> a double presidency. <laughs> right. So <laughs> a single one seeming a little problematic. Yeah, we'll That's take correct. a halfsies. Yeah, we'll yep. take we'll take a halfsies. <laughs> So, right. so I recently got Money in Possessions, which is <laughs> I, uh, it's a book. I, I personally don't have Money in Possessions. I've been in grad school a long time. But um, it, it is a, a resource in the interpretation series that uh, recently came out. And, and, and I think the, the way in which you frame the question of Money in Possessions in it might be a real uh, uh, important way to really start this conversation because – uh, a lot of the questions people send in and topics are so kind of contemporary, but what you do in that book, I think, is is really frame it out that in Scripture there is a contest between commodity and covenant, and that question, kind of framed by the Exodus, runs throughout um, uh, throughout the Scripture. So, so, so maybe you can kind of uh, introduce us to the the framework in which you begin to look at the question of money and possessions. Right. Well, it took me a very long time to figure out uh, how to try to shape the book because there is so much material on money and possessions in the Bible that I and I couldn't find any uh, pattern or taxonomy to work with. So what I uh, decided to do was just to start with Genesis and work through to uh, Revelation and uh, take bigger sections of the canonical material. Uh, and, uh, as you indicated, my, my, uh, favorite beginning place for everything is the Exodus narrative. And, uh, the way I had long set up the Exodus narrative, uh, is that, uh, Pharaoh presides over a, uh, extractive predatory economy and, uh, that, uh, the, the Exodus community is a covenantal alternative. So having established that pattern of, uh, a predatory extraction and covenant as an alternative, I sort of uh, worked through the text that way. And uh, I think without uh, forcing matters much at all, I was simply astonished to find out uh, that that same issue simply recurs almost everywhere in Scripture uh, with uh, advocacy uh, for uh, covenantal economics and resistance to an extractive predatory economy. So once I got that uh, grid worked out and began to see uh, how it uh, recurred in so many places, um, then I was sort of off and running. Mm -hmm. And obviously uh, that's uh, 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 immediately contemporary uh, to our economic situation in the United States uh, because we do live in a predatory extractive economy, uh, and I take it that uh, the uh, the mission of the church and its allies are to try to practice and model and advocate for uh, a neighborly economy that would be an alternative to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it is uh, immediately contemporary. Mm-hmm. When you think of the Exodus as a paradigm, uh, maybe you could introduce us to four of the characters, like the role Joseph plays in setting it up, Moses, Pharaoh, and God. Yes. Well, if you if you uh, begin with the with the book of Genesis, uh, uh, in Genesis twelve, it is reported that uh, Pharaoh had all the all the food; he had a monopoly 
and Abraham went down to get food in the in the uh, famine. But then when you get to the Joseph narrative, uh, Pharaoh has these incredible nightmares uh, about uh, lean cows eating fat cows, and he doesn't know what it means. So he finally uh, finds uh, uh, Joseph, uh, an Israelite, to interpret the dream. And uh, what Joseph tells him is that you had a dream uh, about scarcity and uh, running out of food uh, by way of a famine. So there's there's something very ironic that the guy with the most has the nightmare about scarcity, and uh, then he implements uh, a policy that is that is executed by Joseph, who becomes his hatchet man uh, to uh, uh, tax peasants out of their land and out of their food, and eventually uh, reduce them to. Uh, to poverty and therefore to slavery. So the way I understand uh, Pharaoh's character working out in this story is that he is a uh, character uh, that is beset by huge anxiety, and anxiety makes him greedy, and he is greedy uh, to accumulate more food and more money and more land until he finally has a monopoly. Uh, so that seems to me to be a perfect model sure. of what happens to, uh, in a predatory economy. Uh, and then uh, Moses becomes the point person uh, for the counter-narrative uh, that means to uh, resist and refuse and escape the predatory economy of uh, Pharaoh. And uh, uh, the way the story goes is that... Uh, uh, Moses is moved with indignation uh, about the uh, exploitation of, of Pharaoh, and then uh, uh, God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, enters the picture and uh, gives legitimacy uh, to the uh, slave community departing uh, the economy of Pharaoh, and eventually they wind up at uh, Sinai and make a covenant, uh, and uh, eventually the covenantal tradition uh, lays out the guidelines for a neighborly economy uh, that is a complete contrast to the economy of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it really is Moses and Yahweh who are allied together, uh, who resist Pharaoh and uh, then uh, authorize uh, an alternative economy that for Christians then, uh, that alternative economy uh, becomes embodied in the practice of Jesus and the label for that uh, alternative economy in the Jesus tradition, it's called the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God uh, comes to be the antithesis of the kingdom of Pharaoh. Well, so that's yeah. how I read it. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, while, while you were talking, it occurred to me that um, your spin or, or, your, or your comment about Pharaoh and um, the anxiety in his dream, it kind of puts a different spin perhaps on Jesus's comment about not being anxious for tomorrow, that perhaps what's really being addressed there particularly is, and very materially is the anxiety of wealth. I, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Because as you know, in the Lucan version, uh, that, that, uh, teaching to the disciples not to be anxious uh, is preceded by the parable uh, about the uh, rich guy who uh, wanted more and died in his wealth. Yeah. So that I think the way, the way those uh, two texts back to back in Luke work, that he tells this story about uh, devouring wealth, and then he instructs his disciples uh, not to be trapped in it. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, which which in some ways really only serves to highlight the complexity of the situation that we find ourselves in now in a sort of consumer capitalist society and a segment of that society that, that prizes and sets the accomplishment and the achievement of certain kind of wealth goals as a as a means of ameliorating the problems of life when arguably at least in your take, what we get is that actually that might be a central cause of deep-seated human anxiety. So we're drinking the poison, hoping for a cure. I think that's exactly right, and and I think that the the I've been reading Freud, so you know. 
for me? I've been reading Freud, so you know. <laughs> yes, yes, it's all there. Uh, and I think that, that uh, the ideology of consumerism uh, is designed to generate uh, anxiety uh, because you ought to be anxious till you get the next product. And you don't have it yet, uh, and so you don't own enough, you haven't done enough, you haven't been enough. Uh, but if you will invest in our product, uh, then you'll probably be okay. Yeah, and also it's a it's a society um, that trades in uh, the development of false desire. So then you're not actually sure if what you want is really what you want, and um, consequently, it's a very vicious vicious circle of um, dynamics that come into play. That's right. My friend tells me that, that this whole uh, advertising game was uh, invented in the United States by the shoe industry, that uh, they figured out that they could manufacture in eight months all that the market needed for 12 months of selling shoes. Yeah. So they had to figure out how to create more desire for shoes to uh, buy up the shoes that would be produced in the extra four months, which were shoes that people didn't need, uh, but they had to uh, uh, use advertising to create a false desire for them. Yeah, well, yeah, there's, I, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a really remarkable um, documentary called um, The Century of the Self. Mm -hmm. And um, in that documentary, there's a whole section on this guy, um, Edward Bernays, who is called the father of public relations. And he was actually the nephew of Freud, and he used uh, he, oh, wow. <laughs> and he um, he basically worked um, for the U the U.S. government for Woodrow Wilson in the peace talks um, after after the war, and then uh, and then was hired by um, companies to uh, help them to apply those same kind of techniques to the world of consumerism. And some people say that that he sort of in an almost singular way, became the architect of the creation of um, desire for things, the transformational desire of um, products in uh, American culture. It's interesting. It's amazing to be able to uh, pinpoint it that way, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know wow. if I'd, I don't know if I'd saddle one guy with the whole deal, but um, <laughs> at least it's, at least it's a starting <laughs> right. point. At least it's somewhere to go. Well, you can get always scapegoated. Man. Yeah. Well, we don't believe in scapegoating much. <laughs> right. Have you, have you not read well, Walter? We don't Bible believe in that. <laughs> the Bible blames it all on Pharaoh, so yes, there you true, go. Actually. Fair <laughs> enough, then. Yeah. So in, you developed this concept of uh, of a totalism, and I think we remember uh, the hand motions that came along with it at, um, at a vacation Bible school when you were out here. Um, but you talk about today's totalism in in comparison to kind of Pharaoh's as a market ideology, and and there's a sense where you the coercive power of the totalism desires to stay hidden so that we don't know we're being ruled, and I think that's connected to what you are you were just saying. And um, maybe you could describe like places you see that at work in Scripture, because I know that a lot of Christians that are uh, you know, could say. Um, more faithful to market ideology than uh, Christian convictions w would just generally resist the dominant totalism of today being um, this market ideology. Which, which simply uh, shows how we have been um, uh, uh, imprisoned in it, that we are incapable of thinking outside of it in a critical way. So totalism uh, is a, uh, that's a notion I got from... Uh, Robert Lifton, it's related to uh, totalitarianism, uh, in which uh, you develop uh, an ideology uh, that contains uh, all technology and all imagination uh, so that it, after a while it does not need to be coercive because it exercises uh, hegemony uh, and we become unable to think or imagine or to act outside of the totalism. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that that probably is where we are now with uh, consumer capitalism in the United States that is now attached uh, to U.S. exceptionalism uh, and uh, uh, 
the the whole uh, narrative of propaganda means that there are no political or economic possibilities uh, that are not contained in the horizon uh, of this kind of uh, capitalism. And uh, anybody who thinks outside of that uh, becomes a very dangerous subversive uh, and has to be silenced in some way, which I think is exactly what the Roman Empire uh, finally decided it had to do with Jesus, uh, that he uh, did not, um, he refused to be contained in the Roman uh, totalism and uh, uh, therefore had to be silenced. Uh, uh, there is a, a German scholar uh, at Union in New York named Bridget, Bridget Call, who has uh, studied Paul's letter to the Galatians, and uh, she has made uh, what I think is a compelling case that the law to which Paul objects in the letter to the Galatians is not the Jewish Torah, hmm. but it is the law of the Roman Empire. Well, and, and therefore, uh, Paul's critique of the law of the Roman Empire, uh, which incidentally leads him at the end of the letter to talk about the desires of the flesh, uh, that Paul is urging the Christian community uh, to think and imagine and live uh, outside the requirements of the Roman law. Mm -hmm. So that's in, in the Christian tradition, that's a perfect example of, of totalism and resistance to totalism. That example actually makes me think of, I maybe it was in Grief, Reality, Hope, or I, one of your books I read recently, where you contrast the Ten Commandments as these Ten Commandments are actually forms of resistance to Pharaoh, and that when you don't understand them uh, as as a as a the formation of a community of resistance, then you could take the picture of Moses holding Ten Commandments and throw it inside the courtroom of today's uh, empire and not know a contradiction. And but that's exactly when you right. See that contradiction, and I, and I think in order to appreciate uh, the Ten Commandments uh, being that is that you have to uh, you have to construct Pharaoh's Ten Commandments or the Ten Commandments of Rome or the Ten Commandments of consumer capitalism. Uh, and that's not hard to do. So I, uh, what I did when I was working on that, I, I uh, took Exodus 5, where Pharaoh says, you're lazy, get to work, make bricks, make bricks without straw. And I divided it up into Ten Commandments, all of which are uh, contribute to the wealth of Pharaoh. The, that's the sum of the Ten Commandments. Hmm. And then Moses uh, offers a counter Ten Commandments uh, that invites people uh not to be uh, uh, deceived or seduced by Pharaoh's Ten Commandments. In, in you and I, and I the think Sabbath that it's in there. Not, it wouldn't be hard uh, to articulate the Ten Commandments of, uh, of uh, consumer capitalism uh, in the same kind of way. That's what I think. Well, can you say something about the role of the Fourth Commandment, a Sabbath, as the most important? Because one of the things I think you've done a great job in showing is that it remains the most important uh, commandment for us creating communities with uh, alternative imaginations. I, I do think that. I think that. Uh, I think that uh, Pharaoh's uh, Ten Commandments in Exodus five uh, meant that uh, nobody got any rest. The slaves didn't get any rest. The taskmasters didn't get any rest. The foreman didn't get any rest, and Pharaoh didn't get any rest. Uh, so they, they, uh, uh, the the, the uh, commandment on Sabbath is hugely uh, subversive because what it declares is that your worth is not established by your productivity, mm -hmm. and uh, Pharaoh. Uh, valued only productivity of making more bricks. So it is a hugely uh, counter uh, commandment that stands at the center of the of the Decalogue. And uh, Patrick Miller has said that the uh, fourth commandment looks back to the first three that concern God and has God rest. And it looks forward to the last six that wants the neighbor to rest. So that in the fourth commandment, God and neighbor meet, 
both of them at rest, both of them not needing to be productive, both of them not needing to prove anything. And uh, that, that is a, a profoundly uh, subversive notion uh, in, a, uh, in an economy that has, produ- that has reduced everything to productivity. Yeah, that's, it's interesting. Um, there's a, a book I read last year. It's quite fascinating. It's called um, 24-7. It's by this writer, Jonathan Crary, and the, the subtitle is Late Capitalism and the End of Sleep. And it's a book yes. about, it's a book about the attack on sleep, basically, that sleep is the last, yep. the last bastion of consumer capitalism. So all of this language of, you know, 24 seven, I'll sleep when I'm dead, the kind of demonization of rest uh, as a, as a means like, you know, don't need to sleep until I die. All of those ideas that we sort of, and, and you see those even incorporated, um, in a lot of Christian circles where the idea that, you know, it's seven days a week, 24 seven for Jesus or whatever it is, you know, this idea that, you know, you're constantly, um, on, on call, constantly at work with no sense that maybe every once in a while you need to take a break. That's right. That's, that's, that's an, exactly inter- right. an interesting juxtaposition. There's, a, there's an article by an by an author I don't know a few years ago, Mark Sluka, and uh, what he said in that article, in I think it was in the Atlantic, uh, that if you do not rest, uh, you do not have time for critical reflection, and so he uh, suggested that the lack of rest leads to fascism. Because fascism depends on people not having the capacity for critical reflection. That's very interesting. Uh, and yeah. I found that a very uh, compelling argument so that consumer capitalism aims to keep us uh, busy uh, and coerced yeah. without the leisure uh, to critically reflect and entertain alternatives. That's, yeah, that's uh, really, and I think that yeah. fits. Yeah, I think it really fits really well. Well, I mean, yeah. n- until until you had a president who doesn't really need to sleep and he's just doing such a great job, we're winning so much our head spins. It's uh, well, you know, <laughs> he's got really nice chocolate cake too. <laughs> nice chocolate. Yeah, cake. and it's a big, and he is a big tilt toward fascism, so it all fits together exactly. So when when uh, when you got to working on this text and you you were going through Hebrew scriptures, which you know, I imagine. That uh, for Walter Brueggemann, that when you go to hang out with Hosea and stuff, you, y'all are like buddies in your head. You've wrestled with the text a long time. Um, and then when you come to the New Testament, uh, working uh, through these images of money and possessions and stuff, like what were the, the new insights, discoveries, threads that you saw running through Scripture that, you know, when the, the task of writing this book uh, turned your attention more and more to the New Testament, you were like, oh, junk, that's awesome. Well, that's right. I, this is my first first attempt to do any critical work in the New Testament. I never had done that before, but this my assignment required me to go into the New Testament, and I was simply astonished uh, and overwhelmed by the amount of material uh, that concerned money and possessions, uh, certainly in the in the teaching of Jesus. But then I was really surprised to find it in so much in Paul. Uh, and then, of course, in Timothy and in James, uh, so it turned out to be everywhere. Uh, and uh, I, I really have uh, got now to uh, spend a great deal of time uh, on Paul because my whole education about Paul uh, never noticed that he cared about the problem of money uh, and uh, 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 Galatians. Because of what I said about Carl's thesis, uh, is is a, is a pivot point for me to to get into Paul about that. Uh, but but then it occurs uh, everywhere, and you, you arrive at that uh, statement in First uh, Thessalonians uh, that those who don't work don't eat. Uh, what what's astonishing about that verse, as I uh, tried to probe it. Uh, is that we usually read it that that ne'er do wells are lazy yeah. and, and they shouldn't eat, uh, but um, uh, you can also read it exactly the opposite way that people who rely on their wealth or on their inheritance uh, never do any work, uh, and that the worker class 
is basically producing wealth off of which they live so that they are the ones who should not eat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I just uh, uh, was, was astonished at, uh, at all that I learned and all that I didn't know before. Uh, so uh, it did seem to me that the New Testament uh, is uh, completely faithful to this trajectory uh, in the Old Testament. I know the, the, that passage about if you don't work, don't eat, um, Gustavo Gutierrez said, and that's why every state should know it's the obligation to give people uh, work with dignity and a living, uh, you know, a living exactly. res- respect. Exactly. <laughs> and, and not Little the other Gore, way around. Uh, in uh, his uh, remarkable book, uh, talks about the ancient economy of Jerusalem uh, in which the uh, urban elites in Jerusalem, that is the king and the scribes and the priests, uh, they didn't do any work. They they lived off the surplus uh, of the agricultural peasants, uh, mm. and they were producing wealth uh, and surplus uh, that those people then lived on and turned into power. Well, and so that's not uh, uh, foreign, right, to today. Like part of our discussion around tax, uh, re, you know, reviewing tax law is because you pay less taxes on money you make without sweating than money you make sweating, right? Like because of investments in, in Wall Street and the like. And I think that it is simply it is simply obscene that that we have that tax arrangement, and I don't think people know that. It, it, but you you can tell who made the laws. When you look about that distinction between earned income and uh, investment income, it's well, astonishing. You know, if anyone's looking for a really cool last sermon at a church, now that's a doozy. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> You're like, look, y'all, it, it, at Stewardship Sunday, I just want you to know tithing, that was so modern. Postmodern, all I want you to do if you're in the top percent, is to give the difference of uh, earned income and investment <laughs> income a tax to the church so that we can lift up uh, the day laborers in our congregation. That's uh, right. That's that is it. biblical. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Just trying to be a biblical Christian yep. here. Um, so w- when, when you introduce these type of ideas, and, and you've managed across your career to, to get invited into more audiences of the church in the United States than almost anyone I know, and and I think part of it is because even when you piss them off, you piss them off by making them read the Bible better than they did before, and 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 that is like a, a real gift. And 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 I know a lot of people who will listen to this and read your books are sitting there going like, yeah. So so if if Brueggemann was hanging out with the same congregation week to week, how would you how would you kind of start to raise these questions? Like what are what are some advice on in bringing the text to life, contrasting it with the totalisms of today, but in ways where people are uh, can uh, start to see the contrast and not just reject it out, uh, you know, up front. Well, I think it's exceedingly difficult to be a pastor now, and and I and I I wouldn't I wouldn't give much direct advice to pastors because it's very tough, but I think that a pastor. Uh, now has to be a teacher. I, I would accent the teaching office of the pastor because we have to give people uh, interpretive categories that they do now not have. And I think you have to introduce those uh, very gently. You have to introduce them in ways uh, that grow out of the text so that they can uh, see the text uh, and see how those connections are made uh, but I think they have to be clear. I, my own impression is that uh, pastors have not read enough or know enough in this area to offer these interpretive categories themselves. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. think it basically has to do with, with sort of the re-nurture of pastors so that they have a different set of tools to work with uh, that that can make sense to people, and uh, uh, there are always people who object to my reading of the Bible. But most people, uh, when I when I get with people, uh, they are uh, uh, a little bit surprised, but they're also a little bit grateful. Very often, uh, to be given categories that make sense at the same time out of the biblical text and out of their own circumstance. And, and I, I don't think that uh, 
we have much possibility of, of converting really hardcore people, but our teaching is not aimed at hardcore people. Our teaching is aimed at the great body of the church who really has never thought about these matters and doesn't have the tools with which to think about them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there is a uh, very good work to be done that way. I don't think it's uh, uh, work that you want to confront people or make people mad or drive people away, uh, but to help people see over time how these questions keep coming up in the text. And and when I, uh, I, I hear a lot of sermons as I get around, and, and I'm always fascinated about how preachers work at stuff, but they... They, they just miss so many openings to talk about this because they themselves do not have the interpretive tools to do that work. Mm -hmm. Do you? What do you think the missing elements or the the things that got missed in their their you know, their their education? Because the way in which a lot of ministers experience the act of learning the scriptures in seminary is learning the scriptures as a, a document that's best explained as just a historical document or um, either the, the kind of different criticisms of the text lead to a distancing of the one called the ministry's piety and the text, as opposed to kind of figuring out a new way of relating to it and engaging it. I think that's right. I, I think that that historical criticism uh, as as important as it has been, uh, by by focusing on historical questions, which means one-off questions, something that happened once, and can we date it? And and what we missed by doing that uh, is the systemic grid that is present in the text when you have eyes to see it. And so I think the whole uh, move of uh, Old Testament study, I think New Testament study too, but I'm not too familiar with it, uh, toward the social sciences that looks for uh, patterns of power and patterns of interpretation. Uh, this, this is a move in a very different direction away from historical criticism. Uh, and, and I, and I think uh, very many pastors have not been helpfully introduced to that way of thinking about the text. And if you cannot identify the recurring uh, patterns of power and interpretation in the text, then we have very little chance of recognizing patterns of power and interpretation in our own society or in our own economy. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so I think much of our scholarship uh, has been a betrayal of, of of this matter. Yeah, and I think it's it's also perhaps w without without that kind of perspective and insight, it's it also leads to um, uh, an illusionary or an illusory view on the relationship of the church to the world it finds itself in. So you become actually absorbed in a system that you actually think you're speaking against when your practices are actually inspired by and um, developed within the horizon of those power structures that you think you're speaking out against because mm. you're in the church and other people aren't. And I think, you know, I think that, I think that's right. Yep. Yep. And I, I think um, that um, one way forward about all this is to pay attention to, uh, uh, post-colonial interpretation, third world interpretation, uh, done in church contexts that were never hooked in enlightenment rationality, uh, be because uh, the political economic questions are too urgent uh, to have the luxury of enlightenment rationality. Do you, I'm interested if you think part of it is connected to maybe the cultural assumptions around God or the way in which God exists in the world. When a lot of, when the scriptures are written and most of the church's interpretation of them, like you don't debate whether God's real. 
And now that is part of our cultural condition. And it, it's led to, if we're framing the viability or speakability of God on scientific or historical or whatever type of terms, you end up with ministers who don't know how to speak the word God in any substantive way. And you tend to the the text, to the character of God in Scripture as a contested and lively character in, in a way that I think for a lot of mainline Protestants, they wouldn't know how to use God that verbosely. And then on the other side, a lot of evangelicals who would really like your work and stuff would, you know, get freaked out when they find out um, um, if you got cornered and were for- forced to answer historical questions or whatever, um, that, that those aren't the dominating uh, things you do when you're engaging a text. Can you describe, like, as, a, as an exegete, the, the, the way in which you understand God as present in the text, uh, impacting the way you interpret it? Well, I'm committed to what Paul Ricoeur called post-critical interpretation, and that means that after I've done my best historical critical work, I want to go back to the text and see uh, how does this text claim to be revelatory, and who is it revealing? And so if you take a narrative text, for example, then you can take other genres, but you start with narrative and and see how God is a character that is present in this narrative. And then the the interpretive question in the church is, what what would it be like if I were a a participant in this same narrative? Hmm. Well, that permits me to discover that I am a participant in the narrative of consumerism. Hmm. And so the big work of my life is to be switching narratives because the narrative of consumerism, which has which has other gods but not this god, uh, is a, a narrative that cannot keep its promises, and so I at least want to entertain the possibility that I could be a participant in a narrative that over time uh, has kept some of its promises, uh, and uh, so I want I want rather. Uh, Paul Ricoeur called it a second naivete. Mm -hmm. I want to come innocently to the text and say, let's, uh, let's entertain this narrative text as though it were a narrative through which we could be living our lives. And what that does is it defamiliarizes us, uh, from the enlightenment narrative that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I I think that what I would want to do as a pastor is help liberals in the church and conservatives in the church see uh, that we are, in fact, situated between these two narratives. Uh, It's more complex than that, but that's what I do. Uh, And uh, to, to raise the question about what does it mean to be a participant in the consumer narrative, and what would it mean to be uh, a participant in the covenantal narrative with the covenantal God? Mm-hmm. You used an image when you were here, and and you know, uh, sometimes when I like things people say, I continue to attribute more content to them than was uh, in the initial statement because I just, like, <laughs> you know, well, one time when I was hanging out with Walter Brueggemann in my office, and we were just drinking some wine, talking with the students and such, you know, Bordeaux with Brueggemann, high quality theological education at the Hatchery, he said. And um, so I thought I would check it with you, but it was really about this. You said um, in response to a couple of questions that the students asked that uh, that that when you come to a prophetic text as uh, as a leader in a faith community, you aren't supposed to become the prophet, but your vocation is to be the scribe where you tend to the text and the way it shook the totalisms of that day to the core. And the pastoral task is is over time to build the relationships and frameworks for the congregation to be equipped to the task uh, addressed by the text and that 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 kind that's what it means to steward a a congregation to hear the prophetic as opposed to kind of you know feel like you went down for truth by being the voice of the prophetic and pissing everybody off that's exactly right i i, I agree with that and and i think that it's uh it's safer to be a scribe, but but scribal work is uh, is uh, important work because, uh, as you just said, it is uh, being a 
a careful custodian of the text and giving the church access to the text. Uh, and then if, uh, if people don't like the text, uh, it's not my text. They don't have to get mad at me if they don't want to. Uh, they will. Some will, but that's okay. Uh, so I think it's a very different way of understanding our own uh, pastoral relationship to the text. I agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did um, when you when you were going in to look at the New Testament, how in particular did the stories we just went through um, during Holy Week uh, take a new tone? Like, did did the the events of Holy Week and Passion Week uh, certain things pop out or, or, or highlight to you as you you addressed them in the context of uh, kind of this material look at Scripture? Well, uh, I, I obviously, I, I participate very intensely. I went to church every night during Holy Week, and, and I, I experienced what we did in worship, you know, according to my hermeneutic, uh, but it seemed that the, the unfolding of all of Holy Week uh, from the triumphal entry on uh, was this clash uh, between the Roman authorities and the Jewish leadership that had colluded with Rome on the one hand, uh, and this uh, subversive who came out of uh, Galilee with his peasant mentality, uh, and uh, this was a, a, a clash in which uh, the Jesus movement was never going to prevail uh, against the power of Rome, uh, and I think that uh, the uh, the uh, passion narrative in the Gospels simply walk us through that clash uh, that on Friday had a quite predictable outcome. Uh, and, of course, the astonishment is that the, the predictable outcome of Friday, as the narrative goes, was not the outcome. Uh, but uh, that's how I experienced it. And uh, I experienced that then uh, with great contemporaneity that, that I do think... Uh, uh, we are participating in the same clash, and what struck me, you know, with I wasn't especially critical, but what struck me about my local congregation walking through this is that these dimensions of that narrative were almost completely missed, yeah. uh, because we did it in a pretty conventional way. Yeah, I mean, do you, what's your take on, um, I mean, to some degree, there, there's the, the, the challenge of, um, the familiarity of the stories and particularly at the, those moments of, of, um, high feast or, or holiday where there's such a, um, sense of expectancy that things will unfold in a particular way, particularly for those who find a sort of comfort in a particular, liturgical style and don't want their yeah. um don't want their um feathers ruffled at least at that particular time of the year but there's also the, a, a sense in which it seems to me that we're such at such a critical juncture um historically you know in our in our own time yeah and you you could argue that w- that within elements of society that there's a growing desire to address the the social realities with with new material and it would seem that there's an opportunity to begin that work within the church but we're talking about money mm-hmm. well what money, i money what in churches. I, I don't think it's easy yeah what i think is that for those who uh need the conventional comforts of holy week uh the liturgy the liturgy can deliver that yeah. yeah uh, for sure. So that gives you a little bit of space in the proclamation uh, to uh, rattle things and shake things up a bit. I think. Yeah. Uh, if you stay very close to the text, uh, be, because uh, what what has to be unpacked is that the Roman Empire and uh, Pilate and all of that are paradigmatic players that keep recurring. Uh, in the biblical narrative from Pharaoh on, uh, so that in order to get ready, if you were, if you were working Luke, 
uh, you you wouldn't want to start with the passion narrative, but you would want to start much earlier in the church year to ask, why is it that when John the Baptist appears in the Gospel of Luke, that Luke takes so many verses to name all of the political leaders? Mm -hmm. Well, he names them all in one paragraph so that they are all available uh, as the story unfolds, and we won't be shocked that they are present during Holy Week because they were introduced a long time ago by Luke, and so on. That's what I. That's what I think you have to work at. Yeah. Uh, and so to establish that these are uh, these are historical, but they are paradigmatic figures, and when they are paradigmatic figures, then we have the capacity to ask, how are they reappearing? in our own time and place, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That's what I think. Uh, That's great. So, um, I don't think it's easy, but yeah, I think yeah. it's possible. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so I, we, we got a number of questions people sent in. So you can say as short as answer or a long as answer or just, just you know, embarrass them on the Internet and say, Oh, that's not a good one. Um, uh, but you know how Twitter works. When when people know you're going to yep. talk to Walter Brueggemann, they're like, yeah. well, ask him this. And, uh, yep. and the first one is, imagine I'm Donald Trump's preacher, and I get to preach one sermon on the one Sunday he's going to show up for uh, worship service at the Presbyterian Church in D.C. Um, w- what what text would Walter Brueggemann uh, point me towards, and, and, and how would he rock it? Well, I'm an electionary preacher myself, but but I I, I think the, the text that Barry suggested from Luke 12 about the uh, rich man who tore, tore down his barns and built bigger barns and uh, the instruction uh, to the disciples to seek first God's kingdom and do not be anxious about the rest, uh, that'd be a great text to work on. And the same person followed up, and uh, what text would you use the week after um, the election to uh, call forth uh, covenantal resistance, uh, shaped resistance? Well, I've been working on an article about that, and I <laughs> well, think convenient. Uh, a lot of preachers have asked me, how can we preach after the election? And what I, 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 my paper is called Back to Basics. And I would, I think I would uh, work from the two great commandments to love God and love neighbor. Uh, and I would, over time, uh, I, I think if I weren't a lectionary preacher, I would spend many months on those two commandments. Hmm. I would want to show that God is a critical principle uh, who exposes the idols. Uh, and uh, it's very important that Jesus said, you don't get one great commandment, you always keep the God commandment and the neighbor commandment together. And I think that that can be talked about in the church uh, in a way that doesn't confront people with being partisan or ideological, that members of the covenant community are simply under another mandate. Yeah. And uh, uh, to not take God's name in vain if you want to extrapolate the Ten Commandments, uh, means not to God, harness God uh, to U.S. exceptionalism or to capitalism or to any of our pet projects, uh, because the Holy God is beyond that. Uh, so there's huge possibilities. And who can argue if the preacher is working on what Jesus said were the two great commandments? If you do the neighbor commandments, <laughs> well, I find that's going to lead you to Leviticus from which it is quoted to talk about what it means to be a holy people. Yeah. If you do the, the love God commandment, that's going to lead you to Deuteronomy, and you got all that neighbor stuff in Deuteronomy. So we just have to do text work. Mm-hmm. We have to show people the insistences of our text, and people do not know that. People do not know that when Jesus uttered those two great commandments, he had the whole book of Leviticus and the whole book of Deuteronomy in purview, which is for most, which are for most church people, simply an undifferentiated differentiated mass of uninteresting material, and that's because we haven't done our work. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So I think pastors have to have to redecide that this text uh, is the voice of an alternative to the narrative of death 
in which we are now enmeshed. And people come to church expecting us to say funny things. So we have a little latitude. <laughs> and we have to seize the chance. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> So um, I think you should write a book on uh, the future of theological education. Is what you should do, Walter. Well, <laughs> just not, can't you just knock that out I in the next couple of days? From that. Yeah, but <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, one of the questions was uh, how you see the role of of artist. Not in creating Christian art, but people of faith. What role do you see um, the artist playing in our contemporary context? Artists, artists have the capacity to imagine us outside the totalism. Donald Trump said recently that poetry is simply to make us feel good. That's not what poetry is about. <laughs> poetry, art of all forms, is to create space for the human enterprise outside the totalism. You know, there's a, I read this really interesting quote from uh, Julia Kristeva, you know, the philosopher lately? Yes. Or recently, um, where she said that she thought that um, art and imagery was um, the the sort of last remaining connection that we have to the sacred, because art alone um, reorganizes and reconstitutes and gives the possibility for a second birth. I thought that was a pretty phenomenal um Well, I think that's notion. right. I but I... But then from it, that it follows that we have to help people see that the Bible is an art form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, to, 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 to treat it as history, as we've done for too long, uh, it, it simply misses the artistic dimension of, yeah. of uh, that, that's, what, that's what it means to say that these narratives are paradigmatic. Yeah. They are artistic proposals for how to experience the world. Yeah. So if you were, uh, one of the questions really focused in on, um, if you were giving advice to someone who's considering, like, so, so wh what, what are you most excited about, um, as, a, as a person of faith that's retired, that's getting to spend more time with, uh, people all across the country? Well, I'm, I am excited about the lines I see connecting from my book on money. Uh, to lots of initiatives uh, that are being taken. You may know that uh, Shane Claiborne and Tony Campola have started a new enterprise in which they're calling Red Letter Christians. And these are evangelicals uh, who are committed to the Justice Project. And I am interested in those networks of uh, people who have some courage and some freedom and some imagination, and I want to be allied with that kind of network. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to great, uh, talk to us, and uh, I'm, I, I'm always inspired when I get to... Uh, you get to hear from you, and doubly so uh, when it's. Yeah, I just wish you wouldn't take so long between books, though, Walter. It's just, it's just unfair. <laughs> you know, we well, I'm near the end of that, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you say that, and yeah, I just don't believe you. Well, well you know. Yeah. We all have our, we all have our compulsions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah if you, if, if, well, it's great to talk to the, both of you, and yeah. uh, I'm grateful for what you're doing. All so, righty. Great. Thank you. That's and, they're all, and they're all using plastic knives. Ba -dum -bum. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep. Yep.